to you up here to f- fellowship with our different gifts and peculiarities as we worship Christ. I'm trusting to God that this will be a mighty and a great meeting. And I believe it will. It can be God is willing for it to be if we're willing to make an effort for it to be. We must put our shoulders together. We must put our not only our shoulders together, but our hearts together. And we must worship him and pray and call our neighbors and get the sick and the afflicted out here and talk among each other, have prayer meetings around in our neighborhood. Can everyone hear? We can. Don't be discouraged. We're living in a terrible hour. A terrible hour for the unbeliever, but a wonderful hour for the believer. For we're near the end time to which we're looking for the coming of the blessed Lord. That's why we're here. Deeming the time, because we know we have not much time left. Now tonight, usually we, this is kind of a get acquainted night. We get to meet each other and shake each other's hands or so forth. And you usually come out and we say, well, we'll, I've never seen you and perhaps you've never seen me, many here. And it's our first time to just kind of get acquainted. So we have a regular little routine that we go through on the first night to kind of introduce the, the meeting, what it means, and the uh, way we conduct our, cell, our meetings. And that way, then you'll know, you'll have some idea of, of what our peculiarities are. Now, the first thing, we're not here to represent a certain denomination. We're here to represent a cause. That cause is Christ. We're here to, for His glory. We have no denominational barriers. We do not want any of those. We want to represent every church that stands for the Lord Jesus. We love everyone. And myself, I was belonged to the Missionary Baptist Church. Dr. Vale here, my associate, he's the pastor of the First Baptist Church here in Ohio at um, uh, Spencerville. But we're neither one Baptist. We're a Pentecostal Baptist. We're Nazarenes, Pilgrim Holiness. Whatever more your church represents, all it represents in Christ, that's what we represent to you, brothers. And we are here to help you. To make this, uh, as Brother E. Howard Cale used to say, a community in which it's easier to do right, harder to do wrong. That's why we're here. It's been said that a divine healing or a divine healer, I'm not no divine healer. I don't believe there is such a thing. I believe the divine healer is God. I believe that we're his subjects of his kingdom. Our faith together brings down his blessings that Jesus Christ, his son, died that we might have. I do not believe that there's any man on earth that has power to heal anybody. I don't believe there's a medicine on earth that has power to heal anyone. I don't believe there's an honest doctor that would ever tell you that his medicine would heal you. If he does... He certainly is wrong. There's only one healing, that's God. Our foundation is the Bible. We believe the Bible to be the infallible word of the living God. And we believe that everything that's done must come from the Bible. All teaching must be based on the Bible. Now, in the Old Testament, they had a way of knowing whether a prophet or a dreamer spoke the truth. That was, they had the Urim Thundum. Many of you ministers and you Sunday school teachers know of it. When a dreamer dreamed a dream or a prophet prophesied, they take them to the temple and there was the breastplate that went over Aaron's breast. And in there was the birth stones of each head of the tribe, of the twelve tribes of Israel. When this prophet was prophesying, no matter how real his prophecy seemed to be, if there wasn't a light that flashed over that, a supernatural light, 
while that prophet was prophesying, they turned it down as wrong. Because it was God recognizing the prophet's prophecy. And did you notice it was done by the supernatural? Always God is supernatural. Where God is, supernatural things take place. And then, if God has always been supernatural, he always will be supernatural. Therefore, but the supernatural must be vindicated by God. We know that there's all kinds of mysticism. There's all kinds of different theories, sensations, and everything in the world today. But in the midst of all of it, there still remains a true and a living God. Though sometimes people see things that maybe would seem shadowy and a little dark to them. But remember that everything Satan has, it's just a counterfeit of the real. Satan cannot create. Satan can only pervert what God has created. There's only one creator. That's God. There's only one healer. That's God. Now, when the old year of Methundum was done away with, with the Aaronic priesthood, God's got another year of Methundum for this priesthood. That's his Bible. For heavens and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never fail, said Jesus. And whosoever shall take anything out of this book or add one anything to it, the same will be taken his part out of the book of life. Therefore, this is the entire program of God. And if a prophet prophesies, preacher preaches, a dreamer dreams, the evangelist speaks, or anything that's contrary to this word, we have a right to doubt the man. But everything must come absolutely on, thus saith the Lord, out of the Bible. Now, I'm not here to tell you that God doesn't do things that isn't written in this Bible. He does whatever He wishes. He's God. But to me, I don't want anything less than what God has got in this Bible, and I don't want to add anything to it, but I want everything He's got wrote in it for you and I. And every redemptive blessing belongs to you and I. The only thing is to appropriate faith to receive it. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. It's all a past tense. It's a finished work. It's something that we just look to Calvary where the supreme sacrifice was made and there we draw remunerations from his death by our faith in his finished work. Nothing that I can do. Nothing that someone else can do. But it's what God has done and what we believe that he has done. Therefore, we take it from the word and base our faith upon the finished work. And I, I say this as I go on record on these recordings, that the right mental attitude towards any of God's divine promises will bring it to pass. I don't care what it is. If you can look at it in the right attitude, believe it, God will make every promise that he's made true. I may not be able to make every promise manifested in my life. I might not be able to make it manifested to someone else's life, but I'll never stand in the way of anybody who can do it. I'll be for them. I'll pray for them. I might not be able to walk where Joshua did with a shout that shook the walls of Jericho. Neither may I be able to walk with Enoch, who took an afternoon stroll one day with God and went all the way home with him. I might not be able to have that type of faith, but I'm contending for that faith and believing it with all my heart and praying God to give that faith quickly because that's the way His church is going home one day. A little afternoon stroll and the rapture will be on and we'll be gone. Now, may the Lord add His blessings to what we do and what we say because that's the integrity of our heart 
is to do that which is right in the sight of God according to his word. Now, I'd like to just ask you something. I made a statement a few moments ago that there was no healing in medicine. Now, we do not claim that we come here to, to tell the doctor you're no more in the game. No, sir. We come here to pray for your patient, doctor. I come to pray for the doctor's patient, God's child, my friend. I do not want to take a patient from a doctor. A doctor has his place. and We highly respect that. And we're praying daily for our scientists and so forth to find medical realms and surgery that will help all the sick and needy. But there never was a medicine that ever healed any man and never was a person who ever said it that was mentally right. God said in Psalms 103, 3, I'm the Lord who heals all your diseases. If that's wrong, then the rest of it's wrong. Every word of God is true. There can be no other. If God's wrong in one place, he's wrong in every place. If he's right, he's right. If this is the truth, then it is the truth. If it isn't the truth, then it isn't the truth. So I would have nothing to do with anything that wasn't the truth. I wouldn't be here tonight, only as I know it to be the truth. Let me just show you a little simple thing. What if I cut my hand tonight with a knife here on the platform, or my hand was cut with a knife? Now, we haven't got enough medicine in the world to heal that knife cut in my hand. It just won't do it. We haven't got no medicine that will heal a knife cut. If I had a medicine that would heal a knife cut in my hand, it would heal a knife cut in my coat. It would heal a knife cut in this floor, this desk. If it will heal a knife cut, it will heal it anywhere the knife cut is. You say, Mr. Branham, medicine wasn't made to heal your coat and your desk. It was made to heal your body. All right. If I have a knife cut in my hand... And I fall down dead. And you would take my body down here to an undertaker's morgue. And they would embalm my body with a fluid that would make me look natural for 50 years. And every day, one of our best doctors would come give me a shot of penicillin. Give me sulfur drug. Pour in methylate. All kinds of salves and liniments. And all the remedies that we have. Fifty years from the day that cut would look just exactly like it did the hour it was cut. Then if medicine is made to heal the human body, why don't it heal it? If I went out here to crank my car and broke my arm, and it, it killed me, and they went and set my arm, put the best of splints on it, rubbed all kinds of liniments and stuff over my arms, and I would look natural for 50 years, that arm would still be broke just like it was the day I broke it. Well, then if medicine is the healer, why doesn't it heal the human body? Then you say to me, well, Brother Branham, well, the reason it doesn't because the life is gone out of you. That's it. Then which is the healer, the medicine or the life? Life is the healer. And then God is life. Life does the healing. Medicine doesn't build tissue. Medicine doesn't develop cells. Medicine only keeps clean while God develops cells. Grows. Mends your arm. Heals up the cut place. So medicine doesn't heal. Medicine is an assistance. Someone said to me long ago, said, then what about pneumonia? If you've got pneumonia, the doctor gives you penicillin. So what does penicillin do? I said, if you had your house full of rats, and they were eating holes through the plaster and all over the floor, rats, and you put out rat poison, killed all the rats. It might kill the rats, but it won't patch the holes that they eat. I said, that's what penicillin is. It kills the flu germs, but it doesn't patch the cells that's been torn down. God has to do that. So he's the only healer. God is the healer. And then it's your faith in God. And many people have faith subconsciously and doesn't know it. Now, the order of our meeting. In America, 
It's hard for the people to see it, the American people. My greatest meetings have been held in Switzerland, Germany, and, and Africa, and India, where as many as 500,000 people attend at one time. 30,000 at a time received Christ, and, and 25,000 healed at one, one instant. Carloads of crutches and things taken from one, one prayer over the people. We people in America are intellectual. We want to be entertained. And it's all intellectual. We're well fed. We're well educated. Too well. And then we get to a place that we know more than God does. The more simpler you can be, the more you'll understand God. Not as I'm trying to use that crutches for my own ignorance, my lack of education. I'm not doing that. I'm only trying to make a point to say this, education's all right in its field. But education and religion doesn't go together. Not by a long ways. Education, science has been the greatest hindrance the Gospels ever had. In the Garden of Eden there were two trees. One was science, the other was faith. When man left the tree of life, faith, and took a first bite off of the tree of knowledge, science, he destroyed his fellowship with his maker. Every time he bites a bite off of that tree, he still separates himself from God. So you don't know God by education. You don't know him by the scientific researches. You know God by simple child faith. That's the way you know God. Forgetting your education, forgetting all the other things, and just simply know that you're a creature of his creation. There you know God by that. Simple as that. And when you try to confine God to one little denomination or one little action, you're limited in yourself. God covers all places. He, he's everywhere. God's all-powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. Knows all things. Can be anywhere, anytime. And he's all powerful. If you get to know how great he is, then you can know something about his power. Look at the universe. Look at the stars. Look at the trees. You can see who God is. Now, the American people has been taught an old Jewish custom. Laying hands on the sick. Someone has said to me many times, Brother Branham, Oral Roberts will pray for 500 while you're getting three. While you're praying for three people, Oral will pray for 500. That, that's true. But, you see, I can't be Oral Roberts, although he's my bosom friend and a wonderful man of God. Yet I cannot be Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts cannot be William Branham. We both have a ministry. Oral Roberts is doing what God tells him to do. I'm doing what God tells me to do. Now, we've been taught a, a custom, laying on of hands, lay your hands up on me. That was a Jewish custom. If you'll follow in the scripture, the Jew said, come lay your hands on my daughter and she'll live. But the Gentile, he said, I'm not worthy that you'd come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will live. Jesus never said to Jairus, Great is your faith, Jairus. But he said to the Gentile, I've never seen such faith as that in Israel. That's what we can't hardly train the American people to do, is to receive Christ and what he said. Therefore, in my meetings, it's not to lay hands on the sick. That's what I, I do not do. I do do it, but not in a measure like Mr. Roberts, Mr. The, Mr. Allen and many of the other men. My meeting is a meeting to, in a gift to bring the presence of Christ so you can touch Him. You can receive His blessing. My hands mean nothing. I'm a man. But once His hand on you, something takes place. Mine might be psychology. Mine might be sensation or feeling. His is faith and power. Whose hands do you need then? Mine or His? You need His. That's what we're here to try to bring you to, a 
recognition of his omnipresence. Now, each night, these prayer cards give out. And the reason we give out prayer cards is to line the people up so it'll be not like an arena. It's to be come into the prayer line with respect one for the other. Each man taking his place. While there's one healed in the prayer line, there's 50 healed out of the prayer line. Always. And now, we used to, I'd, when I first started in the services, I'd just send all the cards out to the ministers that was cooperating, a hundred to each one. The first man got his group in, that about settled it if it's three or four night meeting. Because we don't get to that many. Then it caused feelings among the ministers. The next I did then was send a man down and let him give out prayer cards uh, just all the first day, maybe several hundred cards. Well, then if he wasn't there the first day, you'd never get in the prayer line. There was some complaint for that. Then I'd send him down and let him give out so many prayer cards each day. And then I would call, beginning with number one or something like that, and then go the next night, number two, on the next line of cards, and the next night start from wherever I left off at. Believe it or not, when the man would give out the prayer cards, they would, if they didn't get the number within 10 or 15, they sure wouldn't have it. They'd throw it on the floor. Then I said, I can't do it that way, so I'll just give out the prayer cards, and I'll have some little child to come up and start counting. And where he stops or she, that's where I'll start from. Believe it or not. Mom would have Junior to stop just where her card was. So we're still dealing with human beings. That wouldn't work. So one night in prayer, the Lord revealed to me just to go down each day, give out prayer cards, start from anywhere that he laid on my heart from the time that I got to the platform. Therefore, no one knowed where to give a person a prayer card but put him in the prayer line. One time I had a man that was in the, giving out prayer cards. And I caught him, one other man did, selling a prayer card that would guarantee to get a man's wife up on the platform. He was fired that night. I brought my brother with me. I know he wouldn't do that. When my brother got married, I brought my son. His three people gives out prayer cards. My son, if it's a small group like this, if the groups get heavier, Mr. Mercer here, my associate, Mr. Gold. They are tape boys. Who has the tapes of the meetings, they give out the prayer cards too to help Billy along. And then we just, wherever the Lord puts upon our heart, from then we start from right there. Might have one tomorrow night at 50 and the next night, maybe at 10 and the next night at 12 and the next night at 75. No one knows till we get here. I think that's just as honorable as it can be. Then everyone gets a chance at their prayer cards. Night or by, and that doesn't have one thing to do with it. It only gets somebody up here at the anointing of the Holy Spirit begins to come into the meetings and then all out through the audiences everywhere the Lord God begins to call the sick and afflicted. Now, before we open His Word, we don't have too much time. We want to have you out every night between 9 and 9.30. <clears throat> That'll give you chances to go to your homes and live out of the city. Come back. Let's put our hearts to it now. I'm sure you understand. And if there's anything you lack of understanding, something that you do not understand, my associate, Brother Vale here, is available at all times to explain anything that seems mysterious to you, ministering brother, or wherever you are, or any lay member, anything. If there's a question, if we ever preach anything or do anything that's not a promise of God in this Bible, you've got a right to come to us and ask us like brethren. And we ask you to do that. We ask you as our brothers and sisters to come to us. We want to be servants of Christ. That's what we represent the world around. And I just want to say this to many who knows me and my friends are in here tonight. I just got my telegram back this morning from Durban, South Africa. The vision where 300,000 people will be gathered pretty soon for our meeting, which is coming up right away. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. Dr. Vale, I don't know whether you... Yeah, I believe I did tell you in the lobby a while ago that we have... Gotten back now, I guess we'll, the letter of details will be coming soon. Let us bow our heads just a moment now, as before we open this sacred word. Any man physically can turn his hands, can open this Bible. 
But no one can open the revelation of it but him that wrote it, the Holy Spirit. So let us pray now. Eternal and blessed God, as we stand tonight between the living and the dead, and there is at stake tonight, no doubt, sinners, souls that has never received you as personal Savior as yet, and we realize, Lord, if they should pass from this life into the life that is to come without knowing you, oh, it would be too miserable a thought to think of. So, Lord, we would ask you to search out our hearts tonight, and if there be any evil about us, take us down to the refining fire of Calvary, and there cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that our lips would be cleansed like the prophet at the temple, when he's seen the cherubims with their wings covering their face and covering their feet. And as he cried, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, let the cherubims of God fly through this building tonight and visit every heart and speak to them of the soon coming judgment. And without standing in the presence of Him who is our only mediator, the Lord Jesus, who will stand for us at that day. Oh, what a horrible thing it would be to try to undertake to stand in the white throne without Christ. We would ask You, Lord, that You would fulfill and manifest Thyself in the presence of this people tonight and the resurrection of your dear and beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. We would ask that every man's heart, Lord, would be a freshly a sprinkled with the holy ashes of Calvary, that they might see Him who gave the promise and know that He is present, and by doing so, would accept Him as personal Savior, and the sick and the needy would be healed. May there not be a feeble one, Lord, enter this building this week, but what will go out of here healed. Grant it, Lord, and may a sinner not come in over the threshold of this building, but what would go out of here rejoicing in the presence of of the Lord Jesus as their Savior. We would ask you to bless this school, Lord, who has let us have this auditorium. And we now dedicate this building to the glory of God. And may the angels of God minister day after day and night after night until when we enter the place we would feel it would be holy grounds that we're treading on. Bless every minister, those who are cooperating, who's dismissed their churches. Bless those who have drove long ways to get here. All the local people, give unto them, Lord, thy riches, we pray, in salvation and spiritual blessings and in physical blessings. And may this little meeting start an old-fashioned revival that'll sweep from one side of this state to the other. Grant it, Father. Speak through lips, Lord. Bless our dear beloved brother, Dr. Vale, as he ministers in the afternoon service to stir the pure faith in the people. Help your unprofitable servant at night, Lord. As I come with this challenge to the world that Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. May your unfailing word and your undergirding of your spirit move us in a great way. Forgive us of our sins now and help us as we go enter in this service to read your holy word. May it be said as we leave here tonight. Like those who came from Emmaus, 
when you did something kind of in a mysterious way, in a way that no other man could do it. And Theopius and his friends said, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the road? For there once he had them inside the building and the door shut. He did something like he did before his crucifixion. And they knew that he had raised from the dead. With light hearts and fleeted feet, they rushed back to say truly he's raised from the dead. Grant that same blessing to your awaiting children. For we wait patiently for thy word and thy spirit. In Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. I wish to read a little routine text tonight. And with a, our scripture reading, rather. And our text is found tonight in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I wish to read out of the book of St. John, the 12th chapter, for a portion of his reading, or his writings. And we believe the word to be infallible. It's found in the 12th chapter, the 20th and 21st verses. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethesda, of Galilee, and desiring him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. May God add his blessings to this word. This word that I have just read, after there is no world, when there is no more sun or moon or stars, this word will remain the same because it is the word of the infant God. And this question that was just asked by these Greeks, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And I'm wondering tonight to this audience that the Lord God has sent out for us tonight. Just how many in here, I might ask, would give that same question if they had lived in that day? If you'd heard about him, how great he was, and his great magnificent power, I just wonder if you and I wouldn't ask that same simple question. If we met Philip of Bethesda, I wonder if we wouldn't ask that same question. Now, Philip was one of his ministers. And Philip was the one who introduced them to Jesus. And the question was, not that we might see his power, not that we might see some glorious miracle that he would perform, though he did. But the question was, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And then in our text we find that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then upon this we would wonder if there could be a servant today that could introduce us to this person that it drawed such an attention of the people. Now, we're taught that he was not a forceful preacher. The Bible said his voice wasn't heard in the streets and so forth. And But his words were so perfect until the Father honored everything he said. There was many great men in that day, in the great churches, great priests and scholars, holy men, that seemingly by knowledge were far more able if knowledge is what God requires 
to introduce this great Messiah. But did you notice he come to a fisherman? Just a humble peasant-like man. And said we would see him. And any man or woman, boy or girl, that's ever heard anything about Jesus, that's their heart's desire. We would see Jesus. Now, if he is the same and he is not dead, but he has risen from the dead, could it be possible then that we could see him? If so, how many in here would love to see him? Put up your hand. Just say, I would love to see Jesus. The Lord bless you. As far as I could see, it looked like 100%. Well, then I'm asking this question. If he is so great, why can't we see him? Some time ago, on the Ohio River where I live, there was a little boy who asked his mama one day, Mama, is God so great? Could a man see him? She said, you asked your Sunday school teacher. And the Sunday school teacher was not able to to produce to the little boy his satisfaction. So she said, you ask the pastor. So he went to the pastor, which was the head of the church, and said, sir, I want to ask you a question. I've heard your magnificent sermons of the great God, and I have heard you describe him in such a way Till sitting in my seat as a child, it seemed like he should be right at my hand. Pastor, could anyone see God? He said, no, Sonny. No one could ever see God. And the little boy was discouraged. And he would go up on the river with an old fisherman where he fished with him. And one day after a storm, coming down the stream... The old fisherman with his gray beard was rowing his boat. And as the storm over a rainbow come out into the eastern horizon, and the old fisherman looking up towards that rainbow as the little boy sitting in the stern of the boat, the little fellow was attracted to tears running down his cheeks over his gray beard dropping off on his clothes. And it was so thrilling until he jumped up and ran up to the center of the boat and knelt down at the old fisherman's feet. He said, I'm going to ask you a question that seemingly no one can answer. He said, could a man see God? And the old fisherman, overcome with the enthusiasm of the child, he pulled his oars into his lap and his arms around the little lad and he said God bless you honey all I've seen for the past 40 years has been God what was it there was so much God on the inside he can see him on the out the only way that we'll correctly ever see God is by having him in our hearts first it's always been that way. God has hid himself from the eyes of the wise and prudent and is most willing to reveal himself to babes such as will learn. Learn of him. Learn his way. So now there would be only one way that we could sufficiently answer this question. If I asked in here tonight the different denominations, perhaps Baptist and Presbyterian and maybe some Catholic and Pentecostals and Pilgrim Holiness and so forth, do you believe that a man could see God? You'd say, certainly. Well, I'd say, how would we know whether it was God or not? How could we understand if it was God, 
Then there's only one way to answer that question. That's take Hebrews 13, 8, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Someone would say, I see him in a rosary as I pray the rosary. One would say, I see him in our creeds of our church. Others would say, I see him when we sing the doxology. One would say, I see him as we re- quote the Apostles' Creed, or repeat it rather. Others would say, I see him when I see the saints rejoicing. Others would say, I hear him in the music. Which all those things are good. And I have nothing against any of them. And I'm thankful that you can see God in such. But let's lay that aside just for a minute. And take what the scripture says. That's the Urim Thundum again. If Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever... He's got to be the same in principle. He's got to be the same in power. He's got to be the same in attitude. He's got to be the same in every way that he was. They never knew him that day in saying a rosary. They never knew him that day in what we call an Apostles' Creed. It's not in the Scriptures, the Apostles' Creed. It's not, they didn't know him in the doxology. But they know him as the person God manifested in the flesh. And his mighty works and his deed and his manifestations. Then we'd have to go back and see what his manifestations was. Now, do not listen with any selfish motive. Let your objective be right. Let your motive be right. For anything outside of the right motive and the right objection, God can't use it. Jesus said once, if you say to this tree, if you say to it, to this mountain rather, be moved and don't doubt, but believe that what you've said is being done, you can have what you said. What could move a mountain? Here he told a mortal man, Say to the mountain, And believe that it's being done. Only deity can move a mountain. Only God can do it. Then if he told a man to to do it, it would have to be God speaking to the man. And the only way a man could know it was God would be the right objective or, and the right motive. If your objective is right and your motive is right, then it's not you speaking anymore. It's the Father that dwelleth in you. Take no thought what ye shall say in that hour, for it's not ye that speaks, it's my Father that dwelleth in you. He doeth the speaking. So you see, God's not very far away. He's right here. It's our own selves in the way. It's our unbelief. It's our superstitions. It's those things that blind the eyes. It isn't God. A man walk out and say, I'll show you I can move the mountain. Mountain be moved. It doesn't happen, certainly not. Your motive's not right. And your objective's not right. So we've got to come to this one place. Is our motive and our objective being right with God? Then it isn't you to speak anymore. Now let's find what Jesus was. We find him immediately after his baptism. He was led into the wilderness where he communed with God for 40 days. Coming out before his ministry ever had a chance 
to be manifested. The devil said, Now, if you are a great performer of miracles, let's see you perform one here before me. Do something here that I can see with my own eyes. Then I'll believe you. Turn these stones into bread. He could have done that. But you know, the devil still has the same kind of motives and objectives. An old man down at the corner, that's blind or he's deaf. He's in a wheelchair. Let these divine healers go down there and heal him. Then I'll believe. When you see or hear such things being said, just remember it's the same devil that put a rag around the eyes of the Lord Jesus and hit him on the head with a stick and said, Prophesier, tell us who hit you. It's the same one that said, If thou be the Christ, come off of the cross. Just pull your hands loose. Turn these stones to bread. The spectacular. Do something that I'd see you do it. They'll never see it done. There's nothing in them to see with. They're blind. Now let's watch his manifestation. As soon as he started his public ministry, and if we can follow his public ministry and see what he did yesterday, he'll be the same today. Will you believe that? If we can find what he done yesterday to manifest himself as Messiah, Oh, may I say that again? For there hangs the campaign. There hangs the keynote. There hangs the thing that will shake the nation. There hangs the question that will put every church in Ohio in a revival in the next few days. There hangs the the one and all sufficient thing. What he was, he is. And if he is the same, then we should sell out, surrender everything to him. Our motives, our objectives, our wills to him. But the world will never do it. He said they wouldn't. Man, we're ordained to this condemnation. But God is just. He must perform it. He must do it in order to remain God. It's His promise. The same yesterday, today, and forever. When His public ministry first started, let's quote the Scripture now. From St. John, the first chapter, we started in St. John 12. And you who are taking notes might read it. And we're going to use just a few things for the next few moments. And look at him yesterday. And see if he's the same today. As soon as he was on his public ministry, there was one Andrew who got converted and went and got his brother Simon. St. John 1. And when Simon come up into the presence of the Lord Jesus, Jesus knew who he was. And not only that, but he told him what his father's name was. Now see if that's right. Search it in the scriptures. He said, your name is Simon. Simon. But I'm going to call you Peter. And you are the son of one Jonas. That startled this old fisherman. Now remember, he was not a scholar. He was a fisherman that the Bible said was ignorant and unlearned. 
Acts, the third chapter, Peter and John, they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned. We are taught that Peter could not even sign his own name. And yet by his humility, he was given the keys to the kingdom. And Jesus named him when he came into his presence. Tell him what his first name was. You are Simon. And your father is Jonas. That was Jesus yesterday. Making himself known to his church. He'll have to be the same today if he remains the same. Now, then there was one by the name of Philip that we just spoke of tonight. Upon his conversion, which is out of the same city that Peter was, he had a good friend that belonged to a well-known denomination. But he was a just man. He was a good man. And if any of you here has ever been at the Holy Lands, mark the place where Jesus was at preaching and where Nathaniel was under the tree. About 30 miles. And he went 30 miles to find a friend to bring him in the presence of Jesus. I wonder if we'd go 30 steps today. But he was sold that Jesus was the Christ. And he wanted his friend to know it. And he went around the mountain and found Nathaniel under a tree. And I noticed their conversation. He said, come see a man. Come see this fellow. We have found him. He's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph. And watch this orthodox believer. This good church member. When he got up and shook the dust from him, he said, Now could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Or could there be anything come out of a group of people like that that would be any good? Oh, can't you see the attitude of the world hasn't changed? The one who desired a murder in the stead of Jesus... In their hearts, they're the same tonight. The world said what it was. It expressed itself when they accepted a murder and the stead of the lovely Lord. Just because of religious traditions. And when this man who had helped the custom of the elders very dear, he said, could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? I think Philip gave him the best answer that any man could. He said, come and see. Don't stay home and criticize. Come find out for yourself. And on the road around, no doubt, but what he instructed him. Why, he said, I seen, you remember the old fisherman on the river? The old fellow, Simon? Yes, I remember him. Well, when he come up in the presence of this Messiah, he told him who he was and who his daddy was. Oh, I can say that, or feel that, Nathaniel said, now just a moment. Now, Philip, no doubt, but you've gone off on the deep end. You, you just, you're getting all mixed up. Well, I can hear him say, don't you know the Scriptures has declared that the Messiah is none other but Jehovah? And Jehovah knows the heart. And as soon as he got into the presence of this man. Now, Jesus was just an ordinary man. And when he got into the presence of him, Jesus turned the first time he'd ever seen him and said, Behold an Israelite. And whom is no guile. It astonished that man so much. Until he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? All men dressed alike. He might have been a Greek. He could have been an Arab. He said, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you. 
when you were under the tree, I saw you. How many knows that's a scripture? Raise your hands. Look at the Bible readers. I saw you. How could he see him 30 miles around the mountain? I saw you. Remember, Nathaniel, when he answered, he answered for every believing Jew there was. What did Nathaniel say? He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. If that was Jesus yesterday, he's got to be the same today to remain the same. And he said, because I told you this, you believe, he said, you'll see greater things than this. Now, what did the great starchy Orthodox Jew believe when he seen it done? He said, this man is possessed with the devil. He is Beelzebub. How many knows that to be the truth? He's Beelzebub, a fortune teller. And anyone knows that fortune telling's of the devil. He's reading their minds. And what did Jesus say in return? You say that against me, the Son of Man, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost has come and performed the same thing, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. How many knows that's true? Same chapter. Never be forgiven you. One word against it. What kind of a day do we live in then? We haven't time to go to all the characters that I was going to mention. But one more. And that was, we know there is only three races of people. That's Ham, Shev, and Japheth's people. Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. How many knows that to be true? Watch Peter with the keys to the Jews, Pentecost, to the Samaritans, down in Samaria. Peter, at Cornelius' house, the Gentiles, Acts 10, 49. From then, it was over the world. The three races of people. Now watch. To the Jew, he made himself known that way. By telling him where he was, what he'd done, what their name was. And he manifested himself, and they believed him to be the Messiah. When he went up to Samaria, the woman come out and sat down on the well for water, and she seen this young Jew, looked to be about 50, the Bible said, when he was 30, sitting over against the little panoramic of the well, and notice the conversation. He said, woman, bring me a drink. She said, the well's deep. You have nothing to draw with. And besides, it's not customary for you Jews to speak to Samaritans. We have a law of segregation. Oh, I love him. Listen to what he said. But if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. He let her know there was no difference in races of people. Their color. And he said, if you knew who you were talking to, and the conversation started, what was he doing? Contacting her spirit. As soon as he found out what her trouble was, he said, go get your husband and come here. And she said, I have no husband. Jesus said, that's right, you've got five. And the one that you now have is not yours. You have said true. What did she say? He's a Beelzebub. She said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Watch. We, who the Samaritans, we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? If that was the way the Messiah made himself known in the days gone by, 
It's got to be the same today. Now to you ministers and to you Bible students, not one time did he ever perform that sign before Gentiles. Search the scriptures. Not one time. But he even forbid his disciples to go to them. But that's the way he manifested himself as Messiah to both Jew and both Samaritan. How many is willing to say that that's the truth? That you know that you know the scriptures well enough to know that to be the truth. Let it be known with your hand up. The scripture says so. Search the scriptures and see if there's any other way that he made himself known. Oh, our traditions. But the scripture says it. Watch. Speaking to the Jew spoke of another day. And not from that time until this has it been known. But how many believes this is the end of the Gentiles' age? Sure we do. Then if he made himself known to them back there that way, he's got to make it known today to the Gentiles, or he's different than he was then. And God has to act the same every time. When a situation arises. And if God's called on the scene, the action He takes then, He's got to take it every time when the same situation rises. Or He did wrong when He did it the first time. You see, we get smarter. God doesn't get smarter. He's perfect to begin with. He's infant to begin with. He has no more knowledge now than he had then because he's a perfect knowledge. And the way he acted then, he has to act the same today. Therefore, the Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Christ manifested himself any other way today to you Gentiles, then what he did back there, he did wrong when he made himself known back there. There is a scripture. Even the disciples, when he was fixed to leave in St. John 17, the disciples said, We know now that thou knowest all things, and need not that any man teach you. He just performed those things and showed them. By this we believe that thou comest from God. Jesus said, Do you now believe? Now he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. One day there was a woman touched his garment. And she, that's also St. John. And so when she touched his garment, she said within herself, if I can touch him, I don't care what the rabbi say and what the people say, I believe he is the Holy One. And if I can touch him, I believe I'll be made well. She had been years with a blood issue and could not be helped by any doctor. She touched his garment, went out and sat down or stood up or wherever she was in the crowd. Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? He didn't know. He was not a hypocrite. He didn't know or he wouldn't have asked the question. And Peter rebuked him and said, All is a touch in you. He said, But I perceive that I have gotten weak. He says, Has went out of me. Virtue, strength, power had left him. He said, I've got weak. And he looked around until he found the woman. And he told her her condition and said, Your faith has saved you. That same Jesus lives today. And the Bible says in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, that he now is the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Do you all believe that? How is it then? Touch him. Not touch the pastor. Not touch the evangelist. But touch Christ. And he's got to act the same that he did then. If he doesn't, then we're serving another Christ who is similar to the one that was. But the Bible said he is the same Jesus, the same power. So it isn't the virtue of some man's hands. It's the virtue of your own faith. In the resurrected Christ. My brother and I have nothing wrong with laying on hands, anointing the sick, anything you want to do. 
But the real thing is this, to believe him that he's raised from the dead. And he's present to manifest himself in every power that he ever did. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God will do that and manifest himself in the same way he did then, how many will believe him? Say amen. The scripture then says this. Jesus going away said, a little while and the world world cosmos which means world order will see me no more the unbeliever will see me no more yet ye shall see me ye who's ye the church for I as a personal pronoun I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever the church of the Lord Jesus is broke up in denominations, is broke up in creeds. Sectarian until God can't move in His church. Your denomination don't make you a Christian. Nothing against your denomination. Nothing against your creed. But to know Christ is to know the person of Christ. The Bible said, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. The vine doesn't bear fruit, the branch bears fruit. And the branch will bear the fruit of the vine it's connected with. And I ask any scholar of the scriptures to show me where Christ ever organized the church. I made an organize, organization. Where he ever said a certain bunch of creeds would do it. He said, except the man be born again. He cannot even understand the kingdom of God. If it's a pumpkin vine, it'll bear pumpkins. If it's a watermelon vine, it'll bear watermelons. If it's a grape vine, it'll bear grapes. If we are the branches... Of his church will bear the fruits of the Lord Jesus. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. The same kind. Not a different, the same works that I do. God help us, forgive us of our unbelief while we pray. Heavenly Father, the next belongs to you. We are just man and women who love you. No, this is a crucial moment. A man can say anything. But if you're not there to back it up, then the man's word's wrong. But thou hast given a promise, and thy promise is true. Oh, God, may your church all over this building yield itself to you just now. And may the great Holy Spirit that's in the person of the Lord Jesus the incarnate Son of God come into our beings and move us. And may the unbeliever look and see the Spirit of God moving in His true church and say, truly, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Grant then that our hearts as in our former prayer will be as we go home, saying, did not our hearts burn within us as He made Himself manifested? He'd done something. He did to Theopius and his friend in their presence, just like he did before his crucifixion. Therefore, they know no other man could do it. And they know he was the risen Son of God. Grant the same tonight, Lord. May your children's heart be tender and open. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> just about seven minutes late. Maybe we'll hurry. We're going to call a prayer line. I believe uh, Billy told me he gave out T's or W's, which one? T, prayer card T's. Now, let's begin tonight and just stand up a few people here and pray for them. Now, I want each person to look at your card and just come. All right. I mean, all right. How many in here that does not have a prayer card? And you want Jesus to heal you, raise up your hands. It does not have a prayer card. Now, you don't have to be here in this prayer line, 
Now, if I've told you the truth, Jesus Christ will work in His church, you and I, just the same as He did when He was here on earth in a physical body. How many knows that His physical body sits on the throne of God and His Spirit returned to the earth to live in the church to energize it as a vine to the branches? Certainly. Then He has no hands but mine and yours. He has no eyes but mine and yours. And how many know that the ministering gifts in the church is first apostles, then prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. How many knows that that's right? Now the word apostle means a missionary. The one missionary, while the missionaries there want to be called missionary instead of apostle, I don't know. But the same word apostle means one cent. Missionary means one cent. There's the missionary of the world. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, five spiritual gifts that's predestinated that by foreknowledge God set in the church. It's exactly right. Gifts and callings are without repentance. All those gifts are in the church. I'm not a preacher. Not much of one. I'm just a spare tire, more or less. Brother Vale is the preacher. It's a gift that I have that God gave since a little boy. When I was first born, we haven't got the books. They'll tell you about it. We're just out now. The about fourth or fifth edition of them went forth. The life story. All of it can be checked through any article, anything with the police force, anything that you wish to check it by. Birth records, anything that you want to know, any miracle, anything, it's all authentic and written out. Doctor's statements and all. Now, now, in these next few moments, all that I've said tonight is either going to be found a lie or the truth. That's exactly right. If any person wishes to take my place, you're perfectly welcome to come here and do so. Now, here's people in the prayer line that I do not know. If I looked over here and said, here's somebody here in a wheelchair. Here's somebody in a cot. They're crippled. There's a young man sitting there in a wheelchair out at the end of the line. That man's crippled. It's sure. I'd say, uh, look around over the audience. I'd say, here's the man sitting here. Got glasses on. There's something wrong with his eyes. Sure. What's wrong with this woman? She looks good and strong and healthy. But there's something wrong somewhere. Now, all you out there that doesn't have a prayer card, you just humble yourself and look and say, Lord, I truly believe it. And see if Christ isn't the same, if your faith doesn't touch Him, turn right around in the audience to every person that I hear and find out if that isn't the truth. You put God to a challenge. I, just before I start this meeting, I want to say something. I'm looking over here to my left. I do see someone I know. At the Hammond meeting, an alcoholic in the worst stage where the best doctors of Chicago. How many knows there's no cure for an alcoholic in medical realms? Certainly there isn't. The girl was a batty-eyed wretch. Complete, total alcoholic. In a terrible condition. Tried to, and the inside of her coat with a pint of whiskey to live on it daily. She was at the meeting. And in the balcony, I believe, or however it was, then Fred Astaire's dancing partner was there. A dope fiend. And this young lady, Rosella Griffin, from Joliet, Illinois, I believe that's her. Is that you, Rosella? I'm not sure. A wretch. Skid Row. Just as bad an alcoholic as any skid row could produce. And the Holy Spirit come down and told her who she was and what she was done and pronounced her healed. And now she's a missionary on skid row. Rosella, would you stand up, sister? A lovely, young, beautiful woman that God called from an alcoholic. We'll get her to testify later on in the meetings. And Fred Astaire's dancing partner... Isn't she studying missionary now, Rosella? A missionary on the field also. When they resented it, I believe her father did it first. But she said, oh no, Daddy. He's right. The Holy Spirit never makes a mistake. He's perfect. 
if he's the Holy Spirit. Now, let us be reverent. And I, I want every person, if you will, for the next 15 minutes, just keep your seat, be reverent, pray, look this way, be real reverent, and pray. And if Jesus will manifest himself to this church, this group of people, just as he did as I preached about tonight, how many will go away and say, by the grace of God, I'll believe it the rest of my days. Raise your hands to him and say, I will believe. I'm just as reverent as you can be. The next now is up to God. If I've told the truth, he's obligated to his word. I suppose now, lady, that we're strangers to each other. Are we? All right. Then God knows you and he knows me. If there's anything that, if you're, if you are a, a believer or an unbeliever, he'll know it. If you are a critic, watch what happens. If you're a Christian, watch what happens. Then if he does do it. Now, if I told you, say, lady, you're sick. I'll lay my hands on you you get well. Well, that's all right. But I could guess that. But if he'll go back and tell you something like he did when he done the disciples and the people in that day, you'll know whether that's the truth or not. If he'll know your fault, just like he did the woman at the well. If he'll know what you are, what you're here for, just like he did the woman at the well. Will you believe him? With all your heart? Now, here's a Bible scene perfectly. Here's a woman that I've never seen in my life and, and never spoke to her as I know her. She might have been in a meeting somewhere. Have you ever been in one of the meetings before? You have been in meetings, but I don't know yet. If that's right, raise up your hand so the people will see. Now, one word from him will mean more than I could say in a million lifetimes. Now, if I've never seen you, and this beautiful picture tonight of the Lord Jesus in his resurrection, a man and a woman meeting for the first time in life, if he knew that woman's fault that she was living with a man that she should not be married to, then if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he'd tell me where your trouble is, you'd have to know it comes from some supernatural power, so would this church. But now they might class it like they did in that day, and they, so the unbelievers, a man, no man can come to me except my father draws him, said Jesus. But that... He's done it anyhow, so that the judgment, it'll be known. Now if the audience can hear my voice, the woman seems to be going from me. And the lady is sure for me to pray for her for a physical condition of her body. That's right. She is a Christian. She's a believer. And you have a nervous condition you want me to pray for. That's right. If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe now? Now watch more you talk to the woman. Now you say, Brother Bram could have guessed that. Just a moment. Because there's something else in the woman. The Holy Spirit's moved. Now if he does something different. It's no guess. Check it. It's perfect. Now, I don't know what I told the woman. The only way I know is my boy is here getting a tape. Now, the woman is aware that something's going on. How many has ever seen the picture of the angel of the Lord? Here we got, I see your hands up. Sure, we, I think they got some of them here. It's right here in Washington, D.C. Yes, I see the woman fumbling with something. It's a dish or something. She's real nervous. That's what she is. She's been praying too. And she's praying for somebody else. And that's somebody that's very bad. It's got a swelling. It's an older person. It's her mother. And she has dropsy of the heart. That is correct. That's thus saith the Lord. Do you believe, lady? Do you believe, audience? All right, the handkerchief you're bathing with tears, take it with you. God will grant to you the things that you've asked. Amen. If 
We're strangers to each other, sir. This is our first time meeting, is it personally? I've been in your services, sir. You, you've been in my services. Where was that at, sir? In Indiana. In Indiana. But I don't know you. No, first time we've ever been like this together. Or it, the Jesus that somebody went and got by the name of, I mean, Philip went and got Nathaniel. The last person this year, I believe, was a woman, like the scripture I preached on tonight, the woman at the well. And here's another scripture I used, that somebody went and got someone else and brought them over, and he told them where they was and the conditions of them. They believed. Of us being strangers, you and I, if the Lord Jesus will do the same, would you believe it with all your heart? You know it will come through some power. Your trouble is in your throat. You have a bronchial trouble. Cause you to cough and upset at night times. It's try, correct. Raising up on pillows. Sleeping up. And another thing you have is skin infection. And the doctors can do nothing about it. And that skin affection is athletic feet. That's right, sir. That's correct. That's right. Do you believe God knows you, sir? Yes, sir. You're not from this city. You've come from north, coming this way. You're from a place called Hamilton, Hamilton. Ohio. Yes, sir. Your name is George Burns. That's Barnes, it is. George Barnes. Yes, Return home. The Lord Jesus Thank heals you and makes you well. God. Amen. Your faith in it. God bless you, sir. Have faith. Don't doubt. In the meeting, be reverent now. Don't move around. Be real reverent. Just keep believing. How do you do? You believe the Lord Jesus, lady, is here. If I could do something for you, you're probably about the age of my mother. And if I could do something for you and would not do it, I'd be an awful person. But I can't do nothing. I've explained it, that it's something I want you to believe in, something that's been done for you. Just pray. Now, just keep on. Don't doubt just keep on praying. If the Lord God will reveal to me what your trouble is, will you believe me to be His servant and His, oh, his presence? You be, all right. Ten years. The Lord be good to you. You're in a serious condition. The doctors has give you up on it long ago. You have an infection. Besides that, I see you trying to push down on your head or something. You got a roaring in your head. Oh, terrible. terrible. You're not from this city. No. You're from another country where it's a, or a city that's a great big city. Detroit. And you got a, some sort of a immigration place at the, it's Detroit, Michigan. And I see you sitting at a telephone. And you're talking to someone that's me. You've called me on the phone and I prayed for you by the phone. That's exactly right. Now, if you believe with all your heart, you can go back to your home now and be well. Do you believe it? God bless you. Then go on your road in the name of the Lord Jesus and be me. We are strangers to one another. A lady sitting here on the end of the seat. Right here. Heavy set. Yes. You have need to. You're praying. You believe God will answer prayer? If the Lord Jesus will reveal to me what you want Him to heal you for, would you believe me to be His servant? All right. Then that nervous condition, that head trouble that you've been having... That's right. Wave your hand like that. That's right. It's left you now. You can go home and be well. 
You touch something. Are we strangers to one another, lady? You and I are strangers. We are strangers to each other. I don't know you. If that's right, raise up your hand. All right? Just have faith now. Don't die. You might think, how about the lady next to you there? There, you believe with all your heart, lady? You believe me to be his servant? If God will reveal to me what you need, will you believe me to be his servant? All right. If you believe it with all your heart, you can have it. And that low blood pressure you've been having has gone from you now. You can go home. Be well. Just believe. Don't doubt. Will you do me a favor? That hand that you're shaking, lay it on the lady next to you. The lady's having heart trouble. A fluttering around her heart. Especially after you eat and lay down. That's right. It's not exactly a heart trouble. It's a gas on your stomach from a gastric condition. You've had that for a long time. That's right. Wave your hand if that's right. Now it's gone from you. You can go home and be well. I challenge your faith in Jesus' name. Just what did they touch? Not me. They touched the high priest. The Christ. We're strangers to each other, I believe. If that's right, would you raise your hand? If the Lord God will reveal to me what your trouble is, you'll accept it? I see the woman in a doctor's office. Some sort of a room. It could be a hospital room. And she's being examined and her blouse is all... It's in your breast. And it's tumors. And they're in both breasts. And the doctors wants to take them out. That's exactly right. He said you should do it right away. Both the thin men and the heavy set. Both of them. Now who is in the doctor's office to see that? The Lord Jesus who knew Philip was under the tree or Nathaniel. Not only that, but there's something wrong with your stomach. And I see them hold a council and they don't know what it is. Amen. That's thus saith the Lord. Amen. You believe me to be his servant? I sure do. You've got someone in here too who's in bad condition. Amen. That's your husband sitting on the balcony. And he's praying, if God will reveal to me what your husband's got here, will you believe it? He's got arthritis in his hands. That's thus saith the Lord. Now go and be healed in Jesus' name. God bless you. How do you do, lady? Do you believe me to be his servant? What about the lady sitting right here? Wiping your eyes. You believe God can stop that poor circulation? Make you well, that's what you're praying for. That's right. Wave that handkerchief, that's right. Who knows you but God would know that? I don't know you, do I? What's the lady next to her there? You look kind of frail. You believe me to be his servant? Now, Peter and John passed through the gate called Beautiful. They said, look on us. That means just to listen to what I'm saying. You have heart trouble. And you believe the Lord Jesus will make you well? You believe it heal you? If you believe with all your heart, you can have it. You believe mother will get well? You do? If you, that's what you're standing here for. Well, that handkerchief you got with you there, she's not with you, but you take the handkerchief and send it to her. Believe with all your heart and she'll get well. Go on your road and rejoice and say, thank you, Lord. We are strangers to each other, I suppose. This is our first time meeting. Now be reverent. Somebody did something. Somebody in here praying. As a child keeps appearing, someone's praying somewhere in here for a child. Now you just, ever who it is, keep praying. Oh, how 
wonderful to be in his presence. As David said, my cup runneth over. Can you realize that Christ, the resurrected Son of God, is present? Surely our creeds has not numbed our heart to that condition. We don't recognize His presence. What more can He do? I believe you're the person I was talking to. If the Lord God will tell me what's your trouble, will you believe with all your heart? You're standing here for somebody else. That's right. And you're standing here, got a handkerchief in your hand for him. That's a person that's blind. And that's a relative of yours. It's a brother-in-law. And the reason they're not here is because they fell and hurt themselves. If I'll tell you what part of their body's hurt, will you believe? Hurt their back when they fell. That's true. That's right. right. Raise up that handkerchief to God. Now go lay it on them and believe with all your heart, just as you believe it'll be that way. God bless you now. Let's let's believe. Just stand there a minute, Lee. You don't have to come this way. I want to tell you, when you raised up a few moments ago and started across there, when I spoke to you, something taking place, you felt different. Now, you've got glasses on, which you see and know that it's your eyes, especially your left. But do you believe he'll make you well at arthritis too and heal you and make you well? Do you believe with all your heart? Then go around, turn around, go back home, believe it with all your heart. You can get well or go right across this way if you wish to and not have it no more. Be made well. Come forward, lady. Are we strangers to each other? Now I get a, a somebody thinking of telepathy. Now don't think you can hide your life now. You can't. Now stop thinking that. That's sin. What is sin? Unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. Here, come here, lady. You. Put your hand just on my hand just for a contact. If the Lord God will tell me out this way, what's your trouble? Will you believe it to be revealed by the Son of God? It couldn't be telepathy. How many will believe it with all your heart? Raise your hands. Let the lady be judge. You have a lady's trouble, which is female trouble, that you want me to pray for. That's right. Raise up your hand off of my hand. You're healed now. You can go on your own. (laughs) If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Just to let you know that he knows you. Look here. Just a minute. This lady here had the same thing. A lady's trouble. And notice here. You see that young lady sitting right there? Young as she seems to be. Sitting right there on that second row. Hands up to her mouth. Has the same thing. A female trouble. A young woman. That's right. Raise up your hand if that's right, lady. You were healed the same time that woman was healed. Now go on your own. Be made home. If he knows what has been, does he know what the future will be? All right. Lady, you believe that back trouble left you? Go on your own and rejoice and say, Thank you, Lord God. Believe. You're shattered with death, which is a cancer. But if you'll believe with all your heart that God heals you, do you believe it? All right, go on your road and rejoice and say, Thank you, Lord God. And you had the same thing. I said, had the same thing. You have it now. Go on your road and say, thank you, Lord God. Believe with all your heart. Do you want to go eat your supper and that's, believe that stomach trouble left you? You believe it? Go eat your supper then and behold, in the name of Jesus Christ. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Lady, you have a killer, which is a heart trouble. But you believe God heals you? Go on your road and rejoice. Just a moment. A dark shadow sweeping the building. A correct evil. Right here, a little girl playing with her fingers. 
Mother, do you believe that God will heal that child in epileptic fits? If you believe it with all your heart, lay your hand over on her and ask God and don't doubt, and she'll get over it in the name of the Lord Jesus. I challenge your faith to believe Him. He's omnipresent. He's here now, the great, not I was, I am. The great Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you believe it? What about you people here in these chairs and cots and stretchers? Do you believe? What about this man laying here? Yes, your hand up. Laying there on that stretcher. Do you believe, sir? All right, if you believe, raise him up in the name of the Lord Jesus. And if you believe with all your heart, the cancer condition will leave you. You'll go home and be well. Stand up on your feet. Don't be afraid. Rise up. Let's say praise the Lord, everybody. Jesus Christ lives and reigns. I challenge you to believe it. Do you believe it? Lay your hands over on one another. Put your hands on one another. Now let's pray. O oh Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, send thy spirit, Lord, upon the hearts of the people and manifest your great power. Heal them, Lord. Give glory to this meeting. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask it. Amen. Let's say thank the Lord, everybody. The Lord Jesus Christ the Son of the living God is present. Stand up on your feet just a moment. Stand up and give Him praise and glory. Raise your hands to Him. Give Him glory, all you people.